right, Julie, welcome to the Easy Conversations podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm really excited My. to have you here. <laughs> I'm and, so uh, happy to be forward here. to our conversation and uh, learning about your story. So before we jump into it, I do want to give you an opportunity to share with the listeners a little bit about yourself and what's brought you here. Great. Thanks. It's great to be with you today. I, uh, I've been a radio journalist for 20 years. So I started off in public radio reporting, working for an NPR station in Salt Lake City and another one in uh, North Carolina. And then about a decade ago, I switched from public radio reporting. Well, I actually came I came back to my hometown, which was sort of not the plan on the agenda, but mm -hmm. uh, parents needed some help a little earlier than I expected they would. And um, it, I needed to come. And I also really wanted to be able to do that for them. It, it, um, so it meant a pretty big disruption in my career. But mm -hmm. as, it, as it turned out, <laughs> when I came back to my hometown, which is Provo, Utah, the local university, Brigham Young University, BYU Radio, was getting up a radio station on satellite radio. So Long story short, I ended up hosting a daily live radio show for seven years, every every weekday afternoon for two hours, doing in-depth interviews, six interviews a day, seven years, do the math. It's like more than 10,000 interviews, right? Reading several mm -hmm. books a week and just the amount of prep and everything. It was really, really intense. And then, um, and then a couple of years ago, uh, our management decided, well, the future is probably podcasting and on-demand listening <laughs> so so we still have we're still broadcast on satellite radio but all of our daily shows switched to podcast format um fewer so you know just mm. every week or every other week and gave 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 me and my team really a chance to kind of reinvent what we what we were doing and it came at just mm. the exact right time for me professionally and personally because I had reached I had reached a burnout with both the daily radio grind, but also just the news in general, the, mm -hmm. the, the mm -hmm. consumption, you know, the news, like sort of the way it was bumming me out <laughs> and yeah. overwhelming. And it turns out that 40% of Americans actively avoid the news, uh, uh, you know, either all the time or sometimes or specific topics. And so, so be, it gave me the chance to be able to create a podcast for people like me. That's awesome. Thank you very much for sharing that. I do want to understand that news piece because that's obviously crucial and one of the things we want to cover. But you're also at a unique place because this is obviously a podcast and you've kind of been in the world before podcasting. So, And now this is your reality as well. So what are some of the things you see differently between podcasting and radio other than the obvious, right? You mentioned one of the things is the on demand but what are some of the other things and for you specifically what adjustments did you have to make to be able to become a podcaster yeah well um to show my naivete as a radio person right i thought after 17 years 18 years of doing radio i was like well podcasting is just like radio, you just like listen to it when you want instead of, you know, listen in the car. I mean, I really thought that my job wasn't going to change at all. Mm -hmm. um, other than the fact that we were doing it less frequently, which meant that we were able to spend a lot more time vetting our guests and thinking about how to tell the story. And so it gave us a lot more opportunity, gave me a chance for a different kind of storytelling. What I learned quite quickly is that that is the smallest of the changes <laughs> between mm -hmm. radio, especially live radio and podcasting. And the, the thing that caught me the most off guard was, I mean, in hindsight, I don't know why I didn't realize this, but mm -hmm. with radio, there's a, there's a level of distance. I mean, people, you know, you're in your car and you're, which is kind of how most people listen to the radio, you know, or like the old school radio. Mm -hmm. um, and you're, you're sort of like dropping in and out. You're not necessarily ever listening to the very start all the way through to the very end. And you're kind of also a little distracted, right? Cause you're driving, you got kids in the back seat, mm -hmm. whatever it is. And so it's a, th there's a, um, there's a certain level of having to kind of as a radio, you know, journalist having to sort of constantly be keeping your attention and reminding you what we're talking about and kind of bringing you back into the story. And, and the, um, and, and it, I really was, I treated myself I saw myself as more as a, of a conduit, like here's some mm. really great information. Here's some really interesting people for you to, you know, for, that you can learn from. And I'm here to help you, you know, to tap you into that as a radio journalist. Well, in podcasting, 
it's a much more personal, intimate thing because you're doing it on your terms as a listener. I'm in your head almost. Most people listen with mm-hmm. earbuds, right? Um, and it, on your schedule and your, you know, you can pause when when mm-hmm. something else is going on or you need to leave, you pause it and then you can come back to it, right? So it's not like mm-hmm. it, it's there and it's gone. And if you get out of the car to go fill up your tank, it's gas, like you just missed it, right? Oh, well, you missed mm-hmm. whatever happened while you were not in the car. So that level of it, on on the one hand, it was it was exhilarating because it meant that I could I could have conversations that were even more complex and that I could mm-hmm. tell stories and address topics in a much more nuanced way because I had I could I could hopefully count on you to come back and finish if you got distracted or to right. rewind if you kind of missed like you zoned out for a minute there and want to rewind mm-hmm. or listen to it again right so so it's a much more active consumption and the and and then the the other piece that was like that really took me off guard was because that was the exciting piece now the hard piece for me that I'm still working on and that I've struggled mm-hmm. with is that to succeed in podcasting, it it's people were telling me for this right from the beginning. In podcasting, the host is the most important thing. Mm-hmm. You know, people would say stuff like, you come for the content, but they stay for the host, right? And I was like, I am not interesting. I don't have things to say. My opinion doesn't matter. I'm not one of these people who like did live radio where I was just punditing all the time and speaking my mind like that wasn't me I was I was a conduit right nobody nobody cares about the pipe (laughs) you just care about what comes (laughs) through the pipe and so 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 but they people kept saying that's the way to succeed in podcasting they have to have a connection to you as a person Mm -hmm. and and for me struggling to figure out how can I be an objective voice that's authentic that helps people tap into tough topics when I don't know everything there is to know about that topic. So you're not going to tune in to hear me pontificate about this thing because I'm no expert. I'm interviewing the expert. That's my job. But how do I, how do I also create a connection with you, the listener, so that you're, Mm -hmm. so that you're going to trust me enough to spend a lot of intimate time with me in your head, (laughs) exploring these tough topics. So finding that voice and figuring out how to create that relationship with the listener is required in podcasting. And, you know, there's a lot of podcasts out there where people go because, you know, it's some famous person that you love and you just want to like hear them say all the things, your favorite comedian, your favorite actor, your favorite, you know, big thinker or whatever. Right. But then there are a lot of podcasts like mine where I still am not, I'm not the the main I'm not the marquee. I mean, mm-hmm. it's my name on the podcast, but I would really hope that what you're getting, I'm still a conduit, but it ha- it's a much more personal relationship. And so that's right. been the really the hardest thing for me as a journalist who hasn't wanted to like put myself out there in any personal way on any of these topics. And I kind of yeah. have to figure out how to do that now, but okay. still remain trustworthy to you. Yeah, yeah. Well, I appreciate your vulnerability there. And, and that was kind of my next question because mm-hmm. I would assume, again, not having any radio background, but I would assume podcasting, because the listener is making an investment and they are making the conscious choice of tuning in and listening mm-hmm. to you would require that deeper connection. And another important thing that you've touched on is building that trust and rapport that yeah. I can trust this person, right? And there's an element of storytelling there too, which again, we're doing here in terms of your story. So th- th- that I think is fairly different in the podcasting world, whereas radio, like you said, the individual can come in and come out. There's really no expectation on either side, whereas there is a bit more of an expectation here as a listener that, hey, I'm investing my time here and I need to make sure that it what you're delivering is going to be worth that investment. Yeah. Yeah. That every, and the way I have seen it, I mean, there are a lot of podcasts out there that are incredibly Mm -hmm. successful that are hours long of people sort of chit chatting and kind of shooting the breeze and sort of getting to what they get to. Right. Um, I'm, I, I don't have the patience for that kind of listening. So those are not the kind of podcasts that I really engage in. I, I've always been attracted to the kind of audio storytelling, even back when I was an early fan of public radio. And it was more the like the Saturday programs, you know, This American Life was one of the earliest or and then came along Radio Lab, right, to really sort of say, you know, we're creating a 
theater of the mind kind of experience, right? Where there's storytelling or almost like more like listening to an audiobook rather than sort of tuning in to sort of eavesdrop on some friends who are chit-chatting, you know, who I kind of wish I could hang out with. So it's that kind of storytelling. It's the, and, and there's a challenge there because what I'm trying to do with my podcast, which is Top of Mind, which is the one that we started, you know, when we um, started doing this podcast a couple of years ago, is I'm trying to take these really tough topics that a lot of times people are like, I don't want to touch that with a 10-foot pole, or I know everything there is to know about that, or I'm not really interested in hearing any viewpoints on this that I disagree with, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. Those are the topics we're choosing, and we're trying, and, and I, and, and we try through very careful narration and through my vulnerability and through careful selection of our guests and storytelling to sort of lead you in this experience that you didn't necessarily know you wanted, but at the end of it, you've gained some new empathy. You've had a lot of questions spark in your head and you feel like you've gotten so much deeper than you expected to get into that topic. But in a way that I, the way I see it is that, I mean, and we go through so many edits on our scripts and our, like, you know, it takes us two months to put together an hour long podcast because we go through so many edits and so many table reads and we're running it by people who've never heard it before. And we're like, did you get bored at any point? You know, where did your mind wander? Where, what were you feeling at these different points? So we can really try to engineer the most engaging listening experience possible um, without the big emotion that is kind of the go-to for a lot of things, right? So when you think about how how movies keep you engaged for three hours, they have a lot of big drama and there's fight scenes and there's kissing scenes or more and there's lots of big music and there's, are they going to survive and the bad guys and the good guys and a lot of that stuff we love in our entertainment. And I think that there's a level of that that can exist in our information and news consumption. Yeah. But a big concern that I have with, in general, the way the news media has gone, especially in the last decade, is that is that it, it's become too much about trying to push those dopamine hits for you, mm -hmm. you know, like the, oh, you're angry, oh, you're outraged, oh, you're terrified, oh, you're thrilled, you know, those big, like, that's, that's how they, how social media and the internet, like, exists to drive our continued engagement, and I think, yeah. I think that's also a lot of what the media ha is is has been sort of forced to do in order to mm -hmm. remain viable in this mm -hmm. current age. Yeah, yeah, no, I appreciate that. And a couple of things that you're saying there, at least that's jumping out to me, is first of all, you, you need to be mindful of people's attention span. So mm -hmm. there's, like you said, there's tons of podcasts out there that are hours long and people can listen to 40 minutes at a time, or there's some that are shorter, but you have to really keep track of people's attention span, right? And for yeah. me, I feel like if I'm doing an episode, 45 minutes to an hour is probably the sweet spot in there because that's typically an individual's commute or mm -hmm. if they're going to do an exercise or run, that's kind yeah. of that duration, right? So that's what I try to target. But there's some are, that are longer and some are shorter. The other piece you touched on was um, basically targeting people's emotional response. And I see this a yeah. lot on social media. I see this in media in general, even in the news. Now, you said you were starting to kind of have this own personal experience with the news. What was going on for you? with respect to that, yeah. whether it was consuming it or even being that conduit, like you said. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you picked up on that. And that's a great way to connect that because that really was sort of the beginning for me of, of this, um, I don't want to call it like a mental health crisis or whatever. Right. Like I look, I, I mean, I was an anxious infant and I yeah. have had been, you know, like medicated for anxiety since I was a young adult. And so, mm -hmm. You know, I'm chronically anxious and clinically so, and I'm fully aware of it. And, um, and there are certain, and, and, you know, I, I manage it sort of okay most of the time, but, um, but I came to this point where for me, the, the only thing that was keeping me going in terms of my daily news show, but also just in terms of the personal consumption that was required, you know, I, 
I realized at a certain point after, you know, a couple of years ago that I used to be one of these people who like I, everything in my life was, was the news. Like I always wanted to be plugged into what was going on. Right. Like my, I didn't, I never listened to music. I'm a big music fan, but I never listened to music because mm -hmm. all I ever wanted to be listening to, whether I was at home getting ready, whether I was getting ready in the morning, my clock radio was set to the local news radio station, right? Like it was constantly consuming. I don't want to miss anything. And there was a certain level of a sort of like I felt in control and I loved being in the know and it helped me feel confident in my job, obviously, as a journalist to like not miss anything. So I was sort of dealing with my anxiety by sort of over consuming. Um, and also just sort of the, for me, there was a certain satisfaction in uh, in being always plugged into it. And mm -hmm. and there came a point, maybe it was just the, you know, after uh, so many years of that, <laughs> that I my, I just you know, it, it was no longer giving me that payoff, that satisfaction. And it was instead, and I don't, and some of it I think has to do with the shift in the way the media has gone, but also like I was describing, but also some of it was just me. It got to a point where it was no longer serving me anything positive emotionally. I, I wasn't feeling like, oh, I feel good that I'm so connected and I'm so interested and engaged in the world. Instead, I was just constantly feeling like the world is falling apart. Everything is terrible. I'm, it's hopeless. I'm powerless. And, mm -hmm. and, 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 and I would listen to the news and just either want to like go hide in a, you know, like curl up in a fetal position or, um, and, and avoid everything, or I would be angry. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, this was kind of a crisis for me because as a, I'm a journalist, what kind of self-respecting journalist wants to avoid the news and starts in getting into this habit where I would go on vacation and just basically try to ignore the news. Like, oh, phew, I don't have to pay attention for a whole week and a half. And then I'd come back and I'd be like, oh, I miss so much. And, you know, and I would like go all weekend, like I got to avoid the news for my own mental health. But then I'd just be overwhelmed when I'd come back in on Monday. And what did I miss? And, ah, and you know, I feel guilty and the shame and kind of all of this. Right. And I was yeah. starting to think, well, maybe I can't do this job anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and then one day I actually read, and this was sort of a <laughs> stupid little turning point for me. I read this article uh, in, in the Washington Post, it was a op-ed written by a journalist named Amanda Ripley. So a couple of years ago, and her headline of this opinion piece was, I'm a journal, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. I should memorize it at this point because it was so meaningful to me, but it was, um, effectively I'm a journalist, uh, and I'm embarrassed to admit that I avoid the news or that I want to avoid the news or I'm struggling to not avoid the news. It was something like that. Right. And I'm like, Ooh, this, okay. There's somebody else like me. Reading further into it, I discovered that 40% of Americans actively avoid the news. This is like, you know, well-documented survey research that I had no idea about. And for all the same reasons that I was describing, right? Yeah. It's depressing. Um, it feels, I feel hopeless. Um, it, it, you know, it, 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 it's overwhelming. There's too much of it. I don't know. I don't know. And I don't know what to trust. And uh, it feels biased. That was another complaint, right? It feels polarizing. Mm -hmm. And so... That for me um, was a moment to feel like, okay, well, I'm not alone. Right. Phew. <laughs> That's good to know. Yeah. Um, and if an, even a journalist can experience that, then, you know, then for me, that was the moment of like, all right, so what can I do about this? The way I deal with my anxiety, my anxiety is rooted in my sense of not having control over things. And so here was a moment where I'm like, all right, well, I'm not the only one. Maybe there's something I can do about this. What can I control? And that turned into two things. Can we create a podcast that would provide the kind of experience engaging with the news that I feel like is lacking in my life? And one of the key things was this sort of emotional roller coaster and feeling like I was constantly being yanked around or manipulated into either feeling scared or angry all the time um, or, or, or ashamed, right? Can I can, can we create a podcast that will allow people to feel the feelings I'd like to feel, which are empathetic? And, and optimistic and empowered. And that doesn't mean I only consume happy news all the time and pretend that there's not bad things happening in the world or that things aren't serious. No, it means what would it look like for me to engage with really big, tough issues like racism or you know, income inequality or social justice or climate change, but engage with that news and still come away feeling like there's a next step for me? Mm -hmm. You know, what would that empowerment mean? And, and after a lot of soul searching and experimentation, what it's really come down to for me is 
I want to I want to be surprised both in the consumption, my consumption of the news and what I'm trying to provide the listener through top of mind. I I I, I think feeling feeling surprised by by perspectives that make me go, oh, you know, I've never thought of it that way before. Mm -hmm. um, that sort of feel mind opening. You know, I, I love stories where it's not just your same old, same old, like the Democrats are doing this and the Republicans are doing this or the, the good guys are doing this and the bad guys are doing this, whatever it is. Right. But, you know, here's a story of something that's a little more complex where actually you've got, I mean, just to use these political examples, right? You've yeah. got Republicans who are, who are kind of backing this thing that you would have thought they wouldn't support. And why, why do you have a Republican doing that? And here's a Democrat over here. And then actually there's some, kind of some complicated nuance here that makes it so it's not so clear cut. Like for mm -hmm. me, that complexity, that nuance provides a level of surprise that is, that gives me, helps me to stay engaged, but also helps me to kind of it, it kind of takes it more inside my head and inside the logic piece and a little bit outside of the emotional, like, oh, they're always doing this, the good guys and the bad guys, you know? So there's that, and then, but it provides a little bit of distance. And, some, and just the empathy, you know? I want to hear stories of people who have personal stake in the issue. And that's one of the things that's really critical. We are not going to cover a topic on top of mind unless, and the first voice you're going to hear is always going to be someone who has a personal stake in that topic, whatever it is that they've experienced the consequences, they've lived it, they've struggled with it. And that, those kinds of stories to me are far more um, empowering because it's people and people's lives. And it's not just pundits with hot takes who are sort of incentivized to have the hottest take possible in order to get my vote or to make me angry, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the empowerment piece is really just about, like, so if, there's a, if there are solutions that are actually working, if people are actually working to solve this, I'd love to yeah. hear what some of those things are, even if they're not going to solve the whole thing. Like, that's empowering. And even if it's just, you know, when I come away from this episode, it's, it's more complicated than I thought it was. But there's this whole other perspective that I hadn't really considered before, and I'm really curious about that. So I'm going to go do some more research, or mm -hmm. I want to read some books about this, or I'm going to ask this question or think about this question differently next time an election comes up. Like, I'm going to go look up my congressperson and see where they stand on this issue now that I have a little bit more of a sense of the nuance here. Um, there's that confidence that comes with having a little more knowledge that gives me the chance to say, I can engage with this. I don't have to be afraid every time this topic comes up because I'm afraid of how it's going to make me feel. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I, I definitely appreciate that. I think what you're sharing here is, is a significant issue that we don't fully appreciate. And it's the, the idea of empowerment and, and being able to influence because a lot of the times people are just kind of rolling over and saying, oh, I'm victimized. And I, I have to succumb to the the situation I'm in. But what I'm hearing from you is, no, it doesn't have to be that way. And some of the themes you touched on, I think, are very prominent in our society today. You talked about being plugged in. We see this a lot with social media. People are plugged in. And unfortunately, this is just the reality. The, the algorithms are designed to keep you there. So they'll keep giving you information that you're seeking. And it may not give you information that is challenging to your worldview or your perspective so you can actually educate yourself further or learn yeah. more. Uh, because like you said, it's the nuances where it's in that complexity where the truth really lies. And we often just get the surface level, uh, the emotional response or whatever information will trigger an emotional response. Some of the other things I've also seen very much to yourself there, the, the polarization, the biases, mm -hmm. creating this divide, uh, depression for sure. Again, touching on the whole notion that people feel like they have no influence and they're just watching things happen around them. Do you feel like that's by design? Uh, who would, by, by design, by, by whom? Do you mean well, by like the media I mean, or social media? <laughs> well, I, I would assume whoever's behind the putting the putting the information in, out there. I suppose, in terms of right? the news media itself, yeah. the news media. Yeah. Okay. 
All right. You, I'm going to get up on my, uh, I'm a journalist, right? I'm going to get up on my soapbox here for a second. Yeah. Acknowledging, first of all, that I am a journalist, that I've been in this field yeah. for 20 years, that my paycheck has been cut by, you know, <laughs> by news organizations, yeah. um, that I've been in, in newsrooms. Um, I do not believe that most major, either local or national news outlets mm -hmm. are trying to depress you mm -hmm. and divide you because that's their grand scheme, you know? Yeah. yeah. I think it's far more simple and sort of depressing. The, the real truth of it, the reason why that's happening is because that's where the money is. Mm. That as as the information sphere, the news media has, the, the, you know, the it, I mean, blame it on the internet, right? Okay, so the internet comes along, right. first of all, begins to, you know, um, under uh, undermine the, the core source of financing, first for local yep. news, which is the classifieds, and then, you know, advertising, and then Facebook and Google come along. And now, you know, you can get so much more bang for your buck by advertising, no matter who you are, whether you're like the biggest company in the world or the tiniest, you want to run Facebook ads. You don't want to like pay a whole bunch of money to have a pay an ad in the newspaper and your local paper, or even, you know, like in the, on the national television. Right. So it creates, it's created this, um, this situation where it's become harder and harder to sort of, you know, it ch entirely changed the, the economic structure, the financial structure of the news media. And one of the things that has sort of risen to the top in terms of success um, we went through this whole period where people were like, well, no one's going to pay for any content. So what we have to do is figure out how to keep them on our page long enough that we can sell ads so that we can, we're going to sell their eyeballs. We're going to sell their attention. Right. Mm -hmm. Which is, you know, and this was before Facebook kind of locked that down, right? Social media, that's how they make their money is your attention. They sell your attention. Um, and, but the news media was doing that before they were forced to start doing that before social media really kind of right. won at that game. And so there has been this gradual shift over the last 20 to 30 years of what can we do to keep people engaged? And, mm -hmm. at, and then again, as the whole sphere fractured with the advent of cable news and, you know, blogs and all of this, like anybody could start a journalistic out, outlet and sort of produce information for you. Um, it's sort of, you, you go where the people are who are gonna pay you the most attention and stick with you the most. And guess what? We're human beings with, uh, you know, like emotions exist for a reason. Dopamine is a powerful thing. And mm -hmm. it just so happens that we're kind of wired to like it when we feel like we're the good guys and we like to feel outraged. There's a sort of addictive quality to that feeling. I think a lot of us can relate to that, at least in the short term. And so, so you know. That's what gets people to stick around longer is the inflammatory or the clickbait or the what can you believe or oh those evil pick your party, you know, or or type of person, right? That's the stuff that we tend to stick around for that gets mm -hmm. us to click. And when you gotta make your money by getting people to stick around over time, the tenor shifts more and more in mm -hmm. in media towards giving the people what they want. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, and so to your point, and I've heard stories, uh, in fact, around a lot of these, again, social media or media companies will hire behavioral psychologists, try to understand how people respond yeah. very much to what you've described there. So there's definitely a science behind it. But then to your, everything you've shared here, do you feel like that's a bit manipulated and the reason why i'm asking is because i do want us to then talk about why people are more and more listening to podcasts yeah right so if uh -huh. i feel like when i'm tuning into the news or if i'm watching this media outlet and they're not really being fully transparent around the information that they're providing i'm going to go to the podcast world and find a person that i can trust which is what we started this conversation with and get the mm -hmm. information from them. Yeah. Don't you, you think so? I certainly do. And I wonder, but um, I don't, I don't think that 
podcasts are the solution to the echo chamber problem. So, so part of what I think is, is a challenge here is that we live in a, in a day and age where you can choose to consume all of your information, mm -hmm. all of the news from within a lens that you agree with. It is possible yes. to curate your social media feed and to choose your cable news listening and your podcast listening and your print listening to only ever hear Hear it from a perspective that you agree with, whether that is a political ideology or it's a pro-business ideology or it's a, you know, the government is out to get you ideology or it's a yeah. everything is great. And, you know, whatever it is, like you can find that worldview and you can consume all of your news very easily because the minute you start to express a little bit of a preference for that in your online searches, the algorithms figure that out and they're going to feed you more of that stuff. And before yeah. you know it. You're living in this little echo chamber bubble where you truly can, you can, it's so easy to be lured into thinking that the whole world sees things the way you do, or that you're the only people seeing the real thing yeah. because your worldview is the only one that makes sense to you. The reality is that we are all, we all have blind spots because we're all living, you know, I only know what it's like to be a white woman, straight, unmarried, turning 50, no kids, journalist living in Provo, Utah in 2024. Like there's, you know, that is my, like there's a, like there's a lot of worldview that is outside of my lived experience. And the yeah. only way that I'm going to understand any of that is by actively working to try to understand things through, through my consumption and through my interactions with other people. And so mm -hmm. So I think that um, I think that yes, pod. Yeah, I here's here's what I where I think the real potential is with podcasts is that there is a it, there's a different monetization opportunity that exists, particularly when you um, and, and it remains to be seen sort of how this is going to play out. I have to acknowledge straight right from the start that my podcast, a lot of what I'm trying to do. Like top of mind would not be a top rated monetization type podcast because mm -hmm. <laughs> we're trying to cover topics in a more nuanced way. And mm -hmm. I, I want you, no matter what you agree with, whatever, what your perspective is, I want you to hear something in the course of that episode that's going to challenge you a little bit. Like that's the right. whole point. OK, right. so I'm intentionally not going to fit into any one specific echo chamber with the coverage that we're trying to do on the show. But that also means, though, is that I like the easy money to try to monetize it from is going to come from one perspective or the other. Right. But nobody's going to want to fund a podcast that also air, you know, gives a platform to your opponents. Right. I mean, so there's a there's a limitation there. I, I, I worry that podcasting, especially in the, you know, with the monetization, you got to make money in order to move forward. The, the way we're able to yep. pull it off is that we have we have charitable contributions and donors. We're a nonprofit and part of a, you know, a philanthropic foundation that's related to the university. OK, so I don't have to worry about getting sponsors for my show. It's people who care about this kind of coverage, who think this is an important product to put out into the world. They're the ones that are footing the bill. And that is where I do see some possibility here, because whether you have subscribers or you have sustaining listeners or if you're on Patreon or whatever. Right. Like there are, you know, I, there are a lot of people out there. For example, I subscribe to a whole bunch of newsletters that I pay for. I pay more for newsletters than I do even for my regular news consumption, my subscriptions to like magazines and stuff like that or newspapers, because there are there are a couple of uh, newsletters out there like Tangle, Tangle News, uh, the flip side are both. They have free but also paid subscriptions. And I support both of those because they are doing exactly what I'm describing here. They're trying to give a nuanced perspective. They're willing to admit when they make a mistake. They're showing a lot of different sides. They're, they're, you know, they're carefully curating what they're bringing to the table. And I value the fact that they're putting that work in in the same way that I'm trying to do that work with my podcast, Top of Mind. And as a result, I'm willing to support them. And if mm -hmm. there are enough people out there you know, who are willing to support the kind of thing that is going to allow us to have the experience we want, which is the empathy and the empowerment and the open-mindedness and the opportunity to feel a little challenged to make better choices. Yes. Then like, then I'm all excited about that. I just worry that we don't 
necessarily always recognize that that's what we need or want. Yeah. yeah. You know? No, I, I appreciate that. And I agree with you because the system is designed where you, like you said, you can live in that echo chamber and never really have your perspective challenged because now the information that you're consuming is aligning with your worldview. Yeah. So I definitely get that. But to your point, there's also an, another world now that if you are truly curious and you want to understand for your own sanity, for that matter, or mm -hmm. your own, I guess, your own curiosity around getting into that complexity and truly getting into the details, you can go now find that information. So I definitely yeah. agree with you. Now, there's another yeah. side of it to, that you've touched on, because I've seen this as well, where there is that potential risk where now a lot of the money is, you can, you know, attach the money to people's listenership or their subscribers. And a bigger platform can be like, okay, this person's got a lot of subscribers or listeners, they're worth something. I can now mm -hmm. hire this person and pay them a lot of money. And now I can then influence the narrative they're putting out, right? So there is that risk mm -hmm. as well. I don't know if mm -hmm. you see it, but there, there is, uh, and especially in the podcasting world, you're, you're right, because if you're putting in that time and effort, ultimately you want to be able to generate some sort of revenue. But there's that downside yeah. to it as well, I suppose. Well, and I mean, you can look at look look at look at the most. Um, I mean, like so a lot of the most the very most successful podcasts out there. I'm not going to name any names, but you know, they're not generally speaking the very. I don't. I can't think of a single very most successful podcast out there that is sort of like actively trying to not be flashy, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like actively avoiding the goal. The whole way to get more listeners is to be controversial, is to say inflammatory things, is to have, you know, um, antagonistic interactions with guests, or it's to just simply be entertaining or to paint sort of, which is great. There's a to there's yep. totally a place for that, for comedy and for, but when it comes to the news world and discussing issues, you the the again it's the whole like what gets people to come around what gets people's attention and it's the same kind of thing like what goes viral online it's often not the best the best angels of our nature right. you know yeah and so 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 long as the success accrues to the people with the most eyeballs or followers there's always the the top, top, top is almost always going to be, you know, subject to kind of slipping into that high emotion, um, you know, wanting to try to like keep you there and keep keep the emotion high. Mm -hmm. So either either it's fear or like I said, it's anger or it's yeah. continue to give you what you want, tell you what you want, keep you there because they're telling you what you want to hear. Maybe not necessarily sort of in the long term, what's going to be the most productive for you, you know, but, the, but yeah. make it easy. It gets going to go down easy for you. Yeah. And what's yeah, better for us is to have a little challenge, just like when you're at the gym, you know, and you've got to experience a little bit of the pain. You got to tear a little bit of those muscle fibers in order to get something else going on for you, you know, but the going down easy is the part is really kind of path of least resistance to feel like we're the good guys and, you know, I'm right. Yeah, it's tricky. What it's real tricky. Yeah, and based on what you're sharing, I remember something a psychologist that came on the podcast shared with me. He was saying four primary emotions, according to him: so anger, sadness, uh, being happy, and and I think it was fear. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's four. So mm -hmm. you, you can see it. Only one out of the four is positive. Right? I was going to say, <laughs> man, that's a bummer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so you can appreciate why a lot of these stories then cater to those emotions right and and that's the big ones drives, yeah. yeah and they drive people's behavior and influences them um so yeah. so that makes sense now i do want to and one of the things that i've done oh sorry go ahead no no go ahead i was just going to say so one of the things that i've really had to focus on both as a journalist but then this has also been a personal journey as a news consumer over the last couple of years for me is um is to really, you know, as a person with anxiety, I, I took a bunch of mindfulness courses and really started looking into how can I, 
how can I have a little bit better relationship with my emotional experience to where, you know, I, and, and the way this ties into my, my I've really started to be very mindful of the kinds of emotions that I'm feeling as I'm consuming the news and taking the opportunity when I feel some of those, those big three popping up as I'm consuming to sort of be taking a moment of pause, recognizing how I'm responding. Oh, look, I'm clicking through this headline and that's because it's doing this to me. And I'm recognizing, oh, the fear, the anger. Oh, I want to stop reading two paragraphs in because I'm feeling angry or frustrated. Hmm. Well, what happens if I just breathe and then keep reading? What else am I going to learn here? If I can not allow myself to be jerked around by the emotion that this is intentionally spurring in me and instead try to sort of allow myself to feel the curiosity and kind of breathe through that. And what's what it's resulted in is that I'm no longer avoiding the news because I'm in control. Like I, I get to decide how I'm going to consume it. I have habits that I've developed in order to make sure that when things go south for me emotionally, that I'm able to sort of recognize it. And, you know, I've, I've, what is it? I've taken the red pill or the blue pill, right? Like I'm like, I'm like now aware that I'm in the matrix and I can say, oh, all right, here's what's happening to me as I'm consuming this news feed today. I'm going to do something to, to sort of take control of this or to interrupt that cycle right now so that mm -hmm. I'm going to come away with, with more empathy, more clarity, or a sense of empowerment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was something I did want to ask you. So I'm glad you went there in terms of what can people do in terms of, you know, obviously the information is out there. So when they're consuming it, what are some things they can do? So those are three yeah. things that you've touched on. But I think the biggest piece is being aware of when you read something or you watch something or you consume something, the emotional reaction you're having, paying attention to that because majority of the time we're just on autopilot and yeah. a couple of years ago somewhat related i started paying attention to the music i was consuming and it music also has a visceral reaction like depending on the lyrics or just the music in general i started paying attention to that and i shifted it away and it did start affecting my mood for the better. Mm -hmm. um, so, so those are the things that we have to pay attention to as well, even with the news or who we're following on social media or what type of information we're consuming, because that does affect us. And if we're not paying yeah. attention to it, it's impacting our decisions. It's impacting our relationships. It's impacting how we show up around other people. Now, the one thing I did want to come back to that you were touching on earlier too, and I, I've noticed this, especially in the high conflict world that we live in, uh, at least that's the way, you know, you can perceive it at times, but, um, totally agree by the way, we definitely yeah. do. And we live in a high conflict world where there are people whose sole purpose in life and in, you know, money, they're conflict entrepreneurs, their yeah. whole job is to keep us in that high conflict place. So right. yes, continue, yeah. but I agree. <laughs> well, and, and that's where that polarization comes in, but I, I guess I'm in a fortunate place where I'm often able to talk to people on both sides of the spectrum. And often people will just keep sending me news. You know, if I'm on a group chat, they'll keep sending me news like, oh, look at this terrible thing and that terrible thing. And I'm, I'm like, okay, that's fine. One of the things I've done, and I don't know if this would work for anyone, but is to really go out and educate myself because there is information there. One of the things we've lost sight of is books, history. Now, you know, again, the cynics may say history is written by people that uh, win, right? But you can still get to that nuance, like you said, getting deeper into that complexity. You can have a deeper understanding of both sides of the story that can allow you to make more of an informed choice uh, and then influence change too, right? Empowerment. I feel like sometimes when people are just sharing news stories, it's like, okay, yeah, that's great. But what are you doing with it? How are you mm -hmm. making a change? If you truly believe that whatever you're experiencing or observing is unfair, then go out and share that knowledge in a way that is factual and can be taken seriously. Otherwise, you're not really, you're falling prey to exactly everything that you shared early on yeah. and you're not really coming from a place of empathy or, or empowerment. So I did yeah. want to add that, but I just want to get your thoughts as well. 
I think you're absolutely right. One of the first things that I realized that I needed to do when, when uh, in order to have my, the, the first key realization was that it's easy to blame the media for doing this to me, <laughs> for being so terrible and depressing that I, and polarizing that I want to avoid it. But is it possible that my habits of consumption are contributing to that? And what would it look like if I took control of that? And so then I had to think pretty hard about how I was consuming the news. And I realized that a lot of what felt like news consumption to me was sort of allowing the news feed to wash over me on social media, what people were talking about, what people were sharing. Like I felt I started to realize, like a lot of people in the world, if like a lot of what I thought was my news consumption, the way I was being informed about what was going on in the world was actually happening in my news feed, which we've already discussed is highly curated and controlled by algorithms that are intended to keep you listening or reading, you know, keep you focused and make you feel big things that are not necessarily productive. So I unsubscribed from all my news, all the news outlets that I was following on social media. I, I particularly on Facebook, I unsubscribed from all of those, mm -hmm. um, which is where a lot of my news feed kind of was happening. And anytime I see a news article that somebody shares on social media, I just ignore it. I'm like, this is not the safe, this is not the place for me to be consuming news. It's not healthy. I can't control it enough. I don't have enough of a big picture. Just not going to do it over there. Okay, so now that means I have to actually go out and find it because it's not just going to come to me in my news feed. And then I had to decide, okay, well, how, like you said, sure, I could pick a topic and then I could go get a master's in that topic. <laughs> or I could go read every book at the library on that topic. And very quickly, I'm going to get overwhelmed and frustrated. So for me, one of the things that's been most productive is I focus on not just reading headlines because the other thing I realized was that not only was I consuming a lot on my Facebook, but I was also spending a lot of time in, in you know, consuming the news, quote unquote. But what I was really consuming was headlines and the first three lines of articles. It wasn't actually reading the whole article. I mean, I, you know, I love to ask people this question, like, when is the last time you actually read every single word in a news article? It's so rare because, you know, it's like, well, I got the point. In the, you know, the headline in the first paragraph told me what I need to know. Mm -hmm. But you're missing, mm -hmm. as a journalist, I'm here to tell you that the more nuanced stuff, like the full picture, is in the body of the article and maybe even in the last paragraph. And yeah, it may be the least exciting or the least in important, but it's still part of the big picture because it's a nuanced story. And if you just read the headline and the lead, which is what we call the first couple of sentences, you're just getting the emotional hook. That's it. Right. So I started. So my other two things that I will say very quickly is that I, in addition to unsubscribing to news on social media, um, I pick, uh, you know, I would choose a couple of, of news outlets that I trust you know, national news outlets, acknowledging that every news outlet has some sort of bias and every article is going to have some sort of worldview. So I'm not here looking for somebody to do the work for me. What I'm looking for is reliable, you know, credible journalism where they are attempting to find a range of viewpoints and they admit when they make mistakes. And then instead of just reading headlines, I will pick an article and I will read the whole thing, even when I get bored. Even when I feel like I know everything there is to know, even where I'm like, all right, I got the idea. I'm going to keep on reading. I'm going to force myself to keep reading that whole article. And then I'm going to take a moment to be like, what would I have missed if I had stopped reading at the moment I wanted to stop mm -hmm, reading? Mm -hmm. And notice, oh, there was some interesting nuance there. And notice the questions that are coming up. Notice when I started to feel bored because my attention span is too short or when I started to feel angry and wanted to stop reading. So I really focus on consuming the whole article and then go to try to, or maybe I'll pick one topic and I'll be like, this week I'm really interested in the American border at the South. I really want to better understand what's happening down there. So I, all week, all of the articles that I choose to read are going to be those kinds of articles to try to like, mm -hmm. and then maybe I'll be like, well, I should go find a podcast maybe, or maybe I will go check out a book or I'm curious, like this person seems to have some really thoughtful things that they're getting quoted yeah. as saying. I wonder, I wonder what else that person is saying, you know, so I'll go on that kind of journey to inform mm -hmm. myself. And then the final thing that I do, which is probably my favorite hack for really training myself to be better, more aware of my, my emotional response, but also more aware of my blind spots, is that I will, in, occasionally I will, instead of reading a news article, I will choose the, uh, I'll choose the opinion piece. I'll go to the opinion section of the newspaper 
and I'll choose the one that I most disagree with that I can tell right from the headline. I'm like, oh, I don't, you know, that is not, yeah. not right. I will pick that one and then I'll be like, all right, Julie, notice how you're feeling. And I will read every single word. <laughs> and in the mm -hmm. moments where I'm just like, my blood pressure is pounding and I'm getting red in the ears because I'm feeling frustrated and that I'm like yelling at the screen or the paper, I'll be like, what would I ask this person if they were here? What, what doesn't make sense to me about this argument? Mm -hmm. what, would, what could po they possibly have experienced in their life that would lead them to have this viewpoint? I try to get curious in every moment where I feel like I want to get angry or defensive. Mm -hmm. And that, ex that experience, just that practice, has helped me be much more capable of having difficult conversations with people I disagree with in real life. Yeah. No, I, I appreciate that. Thank you for sharing all that. And what I'm really hearing from you there is you're opening yourself up, like you said, to being challenged and changing your perspective. And, and that's crucial. What, one of the things I, I'm curious to know uh, before we come to an end here, as you're reading those news articles, because sometimes I like to then go even refer to the sources they're using. Are they credible sources? Great. You know, what kind of research has gone into that? So for people that are really curious, that's something I would add in there, trying to get the sources, because if they, there's no sources, then where are they really getting their facts from or where are they getting Absolutely. their uh, conclusions from. So that's important. And here's what I would add to that, though, uh, Farhan, is that um, do that to the claims that you find not credible or that you disagree yeah. with as and also as much do it to the claims that you automatically assume yes. are true, because you will be surprised how many claims that you think are the absolute complete truth also actually have very little evidence to back them up. Yes. It's just that they go down easier and so you don't see them because you right. agree with them. Yeah. Yeah. And that goes back to the whole blind spot thing, right? We all have blind spots mm -hmm. and, and being aware of your own biases, which is a work in progress for everyone. <laughs> all of us. So, Absolutely. Yeah. A lifetime effort. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Julie, I really appreciate this conversation. This was great. I got to learn a lot. And one of the things I think is obvious is it's not easy navigating this world, especially if you're trying to consume media and information and you can only do your best at any given yeah. point with the information you have. But there's responsibility that we all have in terms of consuming that information because especially uh, we all have a role to play and we can uh, either be consumers or we can be influencers and we can choose that and, and then then we get to decide where we want to fall as well, right? We have no one else to blame. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, yeah. empowerment is a double edged sword, right? Because yes. you know you're 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 in control, but that also means you got to do the work. Absolutely. So for listeners that do want to find your work, your podcast, or just get a hold of you, what are some ways they can do that? Yeah, thank you so much for asking. So top of mind with Julie Rose is the podcast I've been talking about this hour. The it's the one episode. One episode takes one topic. We dig deep. We go. We're on all the podcast platforms. We're an audio only podcast. So we drop every other week on Mondays and just look for Top of Mind with Julie Rose or Top of Mind Pod on all the social media platforms to follow us there. And I do also want to mention that just in the last uh, couple of weeks, so early mid-July, we launched a new podcast, a companion podcast called Uncomfy, which is actually, it's a video podcast where it's a 20 minute episode where I'm talking with someone about an experience they've had doing exactly what we've just described. Mm -hmm. Being willing to recognize the emotion and instead of getting defensive or angry or shutting down or running away, they stayed curious. Mm -hmm. And they did it. And all the, these opportunities are all around us, both while we're consuming yeah. the news and also in our personal lives and also at work and also in all these places. So it's a great like crash course, one story each episode from a real person about a real thing that they experienced, helping us to see how this works so that we can get better at it as well. So that's called Uncomfy. Sticking with moments that challenge us. If you look for Uncomfy Pod, the Uncomfy Podcast, you'll find it on all the platforms as well. Awesome. Well, we'll put all of that in the show notes, but uh, thank you again, Julie. Brilliant. This was a pleasure. Oh, my absolute pleasure. This was a lot of fun. Thanks. <laughs>